Welcome back, Family Bible Time. We are, oh, there was a, someone walked in front of the camera. Well, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, chapter 15 and 16. We're finishing 1 Corinthians today. Chapter 15 is the most glorious chapter in 1 Corinthians, all about the resurrection body. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the wonderful truth that we're learning day by day. We pray that you'd help us again today. That you'd forgive us our sins, that you'd instruct us and change us and help us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, did, did you notice that? Last of all, uh, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. That's interesting, isn't it? Because he's, he's just jumping into this issue of the resurrection of the dead, isn't he, now? And he's starting off with Jesus' resurrection. And he's starting off by saying that this is the gospel that he preached. So the good news of the gospel was that Jesus died for our sins and was buried and was raised again the third day. And this is Part, all part of the whole message was you can't separate out Jesus' death and not talk about his resurrection because his resurrection is part of the whole deal, isn't it? The resurrection is a central part of the message of God. Now, verse 12, the reason Paul's been talking about the resurrection is and saying how central it is and how important it is is because in verse 12, You'll see, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Ah, now we get the picture. What do you think Paul's doing here? Correcting, correcting them. Well done. It's almost as if the whole of the letter is correction, isn't it? That's because the whole letter is correction. Sometimes... When your parents love you, they correct you a lot, don't they? And you you have the blessing of <laughs> having two parents always correcting you. Think where you'd be without it. <laughs> Some children have all their parents' correction divided between them. You just get the whole double barrel effect. <laughs> Sometimes we correct her in stereo, don't we? Sort of, if poor Karis, if she makes one simple grammar mistake, she gets both of us at the same time saying, saying the same thing. Um, but Paul is, is really serious in trying to fix these problems because they needed to be fixed. And some people in Corinth were saying that there's no resurrection from the dead. That's a big problem, isn't it? Why would that be such a problem? Well, Paul explains it. 
But if there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those also who've fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we're of all, mo of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from, of the dead. Well, death came through Adam, didn't it? Um, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, that God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he ex ex is accepted who put all things in, accept, uh, in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why am I in danger every hour if I protest, uh, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Je Christ Jesus our Lord? I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Now, what, what, what's going on here? Okay, some people in Corinth were denying that the dead are raised. And Paul says, look, if the dead are not raised, then your faith's in vain, because Christ wasn't raised. And if the dead are not raised, why would I be, why would I be risking my life and limb. Do you remember he says, I fought with wild beasts in Ephesus, whether he literally fought with wild beasts or whether he's talking about the people who were rioting, the crazy people that were rioting in Ephesus that he had to contend with. Um, why would he bother if the dead are not raised? What, what, his whole life doesn't make sense if the dead are not raised because he's risking his life every day. Because he's living, Paul is living, in the light of an eternal reward when the dead are raised. So if the dead are not raised, what's it all for? Now, um, there are some interesting verses there about being baptized for the dead. Um, and uh, the subjection of Christ. And I'm just going to say... I want to talk about the resurrection body. <laughs> and you can go and get, if you want to dig into those sermons, go and, go and get the sermons, which I preached on those verses, and you'll find it very interesting. But this is where it gets super interesting. Verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Now, that's not just an innocent question. If it was an innocent question, Paul's answer would be a little cruel, wouldn't it? And the next answer, you foolish person. Well, that's a bit cruel, isn't it? An innocent question. If I said to you, if you asked a question and I said, you foolish daughter, that would not be nice, would it? 
But if you were asking a skeptical question, if you were saying, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come with? You're like, I don't believe that's possible. And then I said, you foolish person. Now that makes a bit more sense, doesn't it? And this is why it makes sense, because Paul's going to show them that actually you do understand about resurrection. Resurrection does happen. He says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Um, and, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed, its own body. Now this is interesting, isn't it? You put a seed into the ground, it seems to die. It comes then alive again. Alive again. And a seed, you, you put it in the ground, it comes out and it, it's got a new body. It's a whole new, a whole new th thing. We almost said a whole new animal. Um, that's, a, that's a figure of speech, isn't it? But you put it into the ground as a little shriveled up kernel of seed that looks like it's dead, it dies, it just dies in the ground apparently, and then boom, it comes to life, and out comes a plant, or maybe an oak tree, wow. And it's totally, totally, God gives it this totally, totally different life after you put it in the ground. And, and you say, well, that's amazing, I don't understand how that happens, of course you don't understand how that happens. It's an absolute, amazing, uh, we'd say a miracle of creation. God has programmed into the DNA of that cell, mm -hmm. everything of that seed, into every cell, into the nucleus, all the instructions to turn it into this incredible tree or a plant of some kind. It's, it's utterly incredible and you don't understand that. Nobody understands it. But it happens, God can do that. God can take a seed and turn it into a tree. Well, so why can't God then take your body and resurrect it and make it different and suitable? And this is one of their problems. The Greek, the Greek philosophy thinking people in Corinth were mocking the idea of the resurrection. Do you remember the... The Greek philosophers on Mars Hill did that in Athens. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some sneered, it says. And others said, well, we will hear you again on this matter. Like that, with their noses blocked. <laughs> but um, some of the people believed. But, but it's a Greek philosophy. The resurrection from the dead just didn't make sense because... In Greek philosophy, the whole ideal would be to be freed from a body. They thought matter was somehow evil. And the ideal would be just a free-floating spirit. It was in the Greek philosophy. But what do they know? They're just making it up, aren't they? In God's creation, the creation, physical, is good. Physical is not wrong. The original creation, when it was all very good in Genesis 1, that was physical, wasn't it? And it's going to be physical in the future. It's not going to, we're not going to be floating around on clouds with no bodies. You're going to have a resurrection body. And just like God can do that for seeds, he, he, he can do it for human bodies. God gives each body as he has chosen. Now, to each kind of seed its own body, verse 38, the end of verse 38, for not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans and another kind for animals and another for birds and another for fish. And there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another kind. So God, God can resurrect seeds, God can transform seeds from being pre previously little shriveled things into amazing oak trees. God can make a body 
that he resurrects of an almost infinite variety. If you look into creation, um, God, God makes different types of bodies to suit different types of environments, doesn't he? One's a bird, one's a fish, one's uh, a different kind of animal, one's for humans. The flesh that he creates is perfectly suited to the environment that it's in within creation, isn't it? Wherever you look, it's just amazing. It's just like, wow. Did you know polar bear's fur is hollow? So it's not white, is it? It's just hollow. Go on. Polar bear's skin is black, isn't it? Isn't that incredible? Why is it black? So that it can absorb the sunlight and absorb all the heat from the sunlight beautifully. But their, their fur is like these hollow tubes, isn't it? So, I mean, God has just made it amazingly. And, and we say the, 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 the variety that God has created is incredible. It, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. God can customize these different bodies just perfectly suited to all their environments. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For star different differs from star in glory. Now listen to this, verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. Mm. Now he's going to take all those thoughts and apply it to the resurrection of us from the dead. What is sown is perishable. So our body, when it's sown into the ground, when we bury it, it's perishable. Perishable. That's the Greek word, phthatos. Wouldn't you like it if in English we had more words that started with th? Thartos. You wouldn't like that? I think it's great. Anyway, Thartos is perishable. It means it decomposes. What? <laughs> so next time someone asks you, how are you doing? You say, I'm decomposing nicely, thank you. But then what is raised is imperishable. It will never decompose. Praise God. God, is, God has made this body now, and it's fallen, isn't it? Since, the, since Adam and Eve fell, our bodies decompose. You, you know that because you've got aged parents, and we're always, <laughs> we're always going, ah, <laughs> groaning, ah, oh. Morning. <laughs> well, if your parents were a bit younger, you, you, you wouldn't know so much about it. But um, when you're young, you just think life is great. You just get up out of bed in the morning and go into the day. And as time goes by, as years go by, you start to feel that your body is perishable. It's decomposing. But it's not going to be like that when we wake up. The moment we close our eyes on this in this life, and we open them again in heaven. No more groans, no more aches, no more pains, no more degenerating. It says in, in, in Romans 8, 20 ish, that the whole creation is groaning. We love to sing that song, don't we? Um, do you feel the world is broken? We do. Yeah. Is all creation groaning? It is. But the Lord is coming and he's changing that. And, and with our resurrection body, he's going to 
suit the resurrection body to the new creation. This is so cool, it's incredible. We're never going to wear out. We're never going to break down. We're never going to need a doctor ever again, or a dentist, anything. I don't know about hairdressers. Maybe you'll be in business. But never, ne we're never going to, there's going to be no hospitals in heaven. Yes. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you'll Maybe we'll just. But you'll, you're going to want to do different styles every day for eternity, aren't you? Um, <laughs> <they're always> <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's sown perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in. What's the word? Glory. Glory. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the 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 no, no angel is looking at you now. You you may wake up in the morning and look at yourself and go, "Wow, I look amazing." <laughs> Less so as time goes by. But there's no angel in heaven looking at you and thinking, "Wow, why?" Because they saw what you're supposed to be like. God created Adam and Eve, and He said it was very good. But since then, humanity's broken. But we're going to be raised, so it's sown, our body now is sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. Glory. We're going to have something of the glory of God connected with our body. Body, you think body glorious. So I don't know if there's going to be mirrors in heaven, but if there were, you'd be saying, wow. Every time you saw yourself, certainly I'm going to be saying wow, because there's going to be so much change. Um, it, is sown in a nat it is sown in a natural body. Oh, how, hold on. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. I, I always want to have that T-shirt made one day. You can get that T-shirt made for me. My next body is going to be a weightlifter. <laughs> It's like people have my next cars a port my, you know my other cars a Porsche or whatever you know. Um, my my other body is a supermodel. That's what you could say, because we're gonna it's gonna be raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Now some people would think those were two contradictory terms, but somehow. The body that's going to be raised is going to be suited to life in the spiritual world just as much as it's going to be suited to life on this earth. So Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, and he's our sample, isn't he, of what a, a risen body, a spiritual body looks like, he could eat, he, you could touch him, but he could disappear and reappear in the next room. And he could defy gravity and just go up into the air, up into heaven. And I don't know what our bodies are going to be like, but it's going to be a spiritual body. It's going to be a body suited to life, both in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. Well, I'm saying that's pretty cool. I'm looking forward to it. Thus it is written, verse 45. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. So he's saying we're going to have a natural body first and then a spiritual body. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, that's talking about Adam, so also are those who are of, of the dust, that's us. And as is the man of heaven so also are, or you could actually translate that, will be better, I think, translate it, will be those who are of heaven. 
So if we are of heaven now, if we're saved, if we're born again, born from above, we will be the same as Jesus, as is the man of heaven, as Jesus is now, so also will be those who are of heaven, that's us in the future, when we're raised. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Uh, and there we have, uh, we, we have it. We are going to be made like Jesus. Wow. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's the verse that you put in your children's nursery over the changing table um, <laughs> to encourage you in the night time. <laughs> anyway, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. It doesn't mean changing nappies. It means being transformed. So those who are still alive when Jesus comes will be transformed. Not everyone's going to die, but everyone will be transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus. Did you know that when the Lord Jesus comes and the dead are raised, and if we meet him in the air to be raptured, we're not going to meet him in the air going, oh, ow, ow, oh, oh, my back. Oh, I twisted my back as I, as I, as I was raptured. Say that again? As I went up. As I went up, yeah. We're going to be changed transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye suddenly would be like woohoo <laughs> I'm looking forward to it are you? I'm looking forward to it because it's going to be glory it's going to be a glorious body a spiritual body it's going to be an imperishable body it's going to be a powerful body wow praise the Lord come quickly Therefore, he says, now, therefore what? Well, in the light of all this, in the light of the whole teaching about the resurrection, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. Now, first verse, first word, steadfast, it actually means seated, like a rider on a war horse, seated, unable to be knocked off immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So think about this, because the resurrection body is coming, because it's going to be glorious. Christian, keep going. Don't, be, don't give up. Labor for the Lord, it's not in vain, there's going to be a reward coming. And the reward in your heavenly resurrection body is going to be something you can actually enjoy forever. <laughs> we can't enjoy these bodies forever. We've told you this time and again. Look, you're, um, you can be the most beautiful person on the planet. It, it won't last. It's perishable. Your good looks are going to rot. You're, you're, you praise God for them if he's given you good looks. Don't get carried away with them because you can't hold on to them. If God has made you strong and you're powerful, you know what? 
a virus can take it all away. Just like that. You can be a gymnast one day and a vegetable the next, mm -hmm. lying on a hospital bed, unable to do anything. It's terrible, isn't it? It's horrible that we're living in a fallen world. Don't cling to this fallen world. Get your eyes set on heaven, Christian. Be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. I mean, come on, get to work. Why? You say, I mustn't do too much. I might burn out my body. Yeah, yeah, boo. Burn out your body. I'm not saying it's good to burn out. I've, I don't know whether that's what I experienced in June, a bit of burnout, but I didn't enjoy it. I wouldn't recommend it. Whatever it is, it's, you know, take, take care of your body up to a point. Paul says um, that, that you know, bod bodily exercise profits a little, um, but godliness is profitable in all things. But, you know, there's benefit in being fit and healthy and eating right and exercising and so on. You can serve better. However, abound in the work of the Lord. Mm. Abound in it. Why? Your labor's not in vain. There's going to be reward. The resurrection body is coming. If you did wear out this body and you wore it out in the Lord's service, you can't lose. Just think Spurgeon, who said, it's better to burn out than to rust out. Spurgeon is now enjoying his eternal reward, isn't he? Uh, and, and every single person has to die. You've got to die sooner or later. You might as well get on with serving the Lord and keep your eyes fixed on the resurrection body because as much as you think about trying to protect and molly coddle and wrap up your own body in cotton wool and try and make yourself beautiful and try and keep yourself lovely forever, you can't. But as much as you invest in the heavenly, you keep. Chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, he moves straight on to money. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Money not for himself, but for the Jews in Jerusalem. As I directed the churches in Galatia, so also you are to do uh, on the first day of the, every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. So giving is supposed to be regular, first day of every week, proportional, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. It's not supposed to be wrung out of you. It's supposed to be voluntary. It's supposed to be something you think through and do intentionally and proportionately and uh, voluntarily. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And so giving it also is all to, also to be accountable and carefully governed. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. That's interesting, isn't it? Because he says, if it seems advisable. And, and, and so you say, well, Paul, you're an apostle. Didn't you just like know all this stuff? No, they had to make choices made on wisdom. Verse 5, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. Paul's making plans, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter there so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened, for me, opened to me and there are many adversaries. It's interesting, isn't it? So he's got a wide door for effective work, and there are many adversaries, and so he says, I need to stay longer. <laughs> when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. I, as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me. For I am expecting him with the brothers. Now, concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers. But it was not at all his will to come now. 
He will when he has opportunity. So that's interesting, isn't it? Guidance and the will of God. You know, Christians, I remember having two different groups of people at one point, both telling me what God's will for me was. <laughs> and, and I didn't know what God's will for me was. And I couldn't work it out. And I was trying to work it out using wisdom and praying and 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 I was trying to come to my conclusion. But two different groups of people were both saying, this is what God wants for you. And I had to politely say, oh, thank you. And try to work it out for myself. But this first encouraged me. It was not at all his will. So Paul the Apostle believed that the right thing for Apollos to do was to go and visit the Corinthians. But Apollos, he didn't think so. And and Paul didn't force him. Paul didn't pull rank. Paul didn't say, but I'm an apostle. I've seen the Lord Jesus. You've got to do what I say. No, he, he allowed Apollos the freedom of will. See, as you grow up and when you become an adult, you, when you're a child, you, your parents tell you what to do, don't they? And they they say, this is what you do, and this is what you're going to do. And the, the older you get, so right now, the more you have to start thinking things through. And we want you to make decisions with wisdom because there's coming a time when you become responsible for all your actions. As a child, we're responsible. We're responsible for your actions, but as you grow up, you become responsible for your actions. And so that's why we're giving you more responsibility now and saying to you, okay, now you must think this through and you decide. And you're like, oh, it's scary. Yeah, it is scary. And it gets scarier as you get older because more and more responsibility falls on your shoulders. But you have to learn to make decisions wisely because as an adult, you have to decide. You can't just ask other people to tell you. And you don't get just like a sense all the time of what God wants you to do. I mean, in this situation, Paul thought one thing and Apollos thought another. So who's right? <laughs> it's both servants of God. It's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes people will be saying, do this, do this, do this. And you'll be like, I don't know if that's what I want to do. Okay, well, you've got to be able to think things through for yourself, make a careful decision, and then stick to it until you realize that, no, that's not what God wants you to do. And, of course, you have to pray. <laughs> so you pray, you try to use wisdom from the Word, you try to make decisions with wisdom, but you don't get... You don't get guidance from God in terms of, you don't have like a, this is the right thing to do feeling. You may have a gut feeling sometimes, I think this is the right thing to do, and you might not be able to explain it, but you can't tell when that's from God and when it's from just your own feelings. There's just no way to tell. So you have to make decisions with wisdom, and these New Testament Christians were really this is really really helpful passage in that because these New Testament Christians, they they didn't. There's no sense in which they had all the time direct guidance from God. And sometimes you've got in the Book of Acts, you know, Paul gets a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, "Come over and help us." Do you remember that? Other times he says he wanted to go into that place, and the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's interesting. They had that. That was supernatural. That was God intervening. But they didn't have a sense of guidance all the time what God wanted them to do. They made plans, as Paul made plans. They thought what was wise. They also had their own will involved, which is what you've got here. Uh, he was not at all willing. It was not at all his will to come now. And they made decisions. They made decisions. And that's what we have to do. 
Okay, verse 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Now, that applies to you too. Yeah. Doesn't mean you have to grow stubble on your chin like me. <laughs> it means you have to be brave. Men have to be brave, don't they? Act, act, act like a man means be, be brave, be strong, have courage. And, and men, what it means is men opposed to boys. Boys play, they're irresponsible. Men take responsibility. Men are willing to fight. Men have to be brave. And he says, stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. That's five, five qualities that should characterize every Christian. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. That's such helpful advice, isn't it? It's more than advice. These are commands. Why? Well, because it's serious, isn't it? Uh, this is a serious business. And um, every Christian has to has to take this a Take, take this uh, instruction from God. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these. This is fascinating, isn't it? So he's telling them that there are these people who have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. These are these are people who've shown themselves to be super servants. Now he says, submit yourselves, be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. This is fantastic. This is like a self-organizing system. So what you do, you go to church, you look around, you say, who is really working hard for God? Not just working hard for God, but working hard to serve the saints. Who's doing that in this church? Submit to them. That's what Paul says here. This is a command to you from God. You go to church, you look at who's working hard to serve all the other Christians, and you submit to them. What do you mean you submit to them? S be subject to them. This is a, a verb that would be like a military term where you line up behind them. You get yourself, so you see them fighting on the battlefield, and in this, using this term, you kind of line yourself up behind them and you say, I'm fighting with you. I'm behind you, I'm with you. I'm just, you go this way, I'll go this way. I'll go wherever you're going. It, it's, it's a fantastic self-organizing system. And, and I would say that this is, God's will for you in the church. You go to church, you find out who's serving all the saints, you help them. <laughs> Simple. Submit yourself to them. Whatever they're doing, help them do it. Mm. It's brilliant because this is this is this is God's way of of sorting out um, how how things should be in churches. If everyone did this, it would just be a dream. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, Achaicus because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such men. Oh, hold on a minute. So we're supposed to be subject to such as these. We're all supposed, also supposed to recognize them. Now, I, I referred to this, I think, when we appointed deacons. It's the business of recognizing those who are laboring and um, refreshing the spirit of other Christians and who are workers, laborers in the church. That's how it should be. The churches of Asia send you their greetings. Aquila and Pris Prisca 
together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. That's a command. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting Paul. Are you? Father, we pray that you would bless this, your word, to us and enable us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Help us to submit ourselves to those who labor and, and who are who are so devoted to the service of the saints. Help us to join in their work and give recognition to them. Lord, give us grace to, to love one another and to greet one another with a holy kiss. We pray for your blessing upon the church and your blessing upon us and that we'd live in the light of this wonderful hope of the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. We greet you with a holy kiss down the video tube, whatever you call it, YouTube. This is our holy kiss to you. Bye for now. <laughs>